Welcome back to The Breakfast. Uh, of course, um, earlier we told you we're moving straight into talking about uh, the um, inauguration speech of uh, new President Joe Biden. Um, there's, of course, been 11 presidents who failed to get re-elected yesterday. America inaugurated her 46th President Joe Biden as Donald Trump failed to get a second term in office. Trump is not alone on the list of U.S. presidents who lost their second term bids although he's the first president in 30 decades to lose re-election. Um, of course, below all the uh, presidents who didn't get re-elected in 19, or 1797 to 1801, uh, John Adams was the first, John Quincy Adams, 1825 to 19, uh, 1829, Martin Van Buren, 1837 to 1841, Grover Cleveland, 1885 to 1889, Benjamin Harrison, 1889 to 1893, William Howard Taft, 1909 to 1913, Herbert Hoover, 1929 to 1933, Gerald Ford in 1977 to 1977, and uh, Jimmy Carter, 1977, and of course ended in 1981, George H.W. Bush, uh, started 1989 and ended 1993, and of course, uh, President, former President Donald Trump, 2017 to 2021. Uh, we have a quick report that we're going to be sharing with you just before the conversation with Professor Patu Tomi starts. Enjoy. With the highest voter turnout in more than a century and in the middle of a pandemic, the presidential race in the U.S. ended with a victory for Joe Biden. Notably, his path to victory was by building the blue wall again, flipping red states and practically swinging most battleground states. For the 81,284,000 Americans who voted for Biden, the 20th of January brings to an end a roller coaster ride. Uh, following a promise to heal a fractured nation, President Biden begins the work of uniting the country after being sworn in as the 46th President of the United States on the West Front of the Capitol, just two weeks after a mob incited by former President Donald Trump stormed the building and tried to overturn the election results based on lies. But this year's inauguration is unlike any other for various reasons. For starters, ousted President Trump is refusing to attend his successor's inauguration, making him the first outgoing president in 152 years to skip the swearing-in ceremony. Instead, the former president and his wife flew to Florida before President Biden took his oath of office dispensing with the tradition of greeting the incoming president and first lady at the White House and riding with them to the Capitol. But President Biden says he welcomes his predecessor's decision. And perhaps the most startling exception is that more than 25,000 National Guard troops were in place to ensure that the nation's transfer of power can take place peacefully. Equally important for the first time, a black woman of South Asian descent is sworn in as the vice president. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. The duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. After decades in politics and two previous unsuccessful attempts at the presidency, President Biden, who happens to be only the second Catholic to take office in America, delivers the most important speech of his life. This is Democracy's Day, a day of history and hope, of renewal and resolve. Through a crucible for the ages, America has been tested anew, and America has risen to the challenge. Today, we celebrate the triumph, not of a candidate, but of a cause, the cause of democracy. The die is cast. Americans, at least those who voted for President Biden and the world at large, wait with bated breath to see if America becomes truly great again. Viviana Guche for PLUS TV. 
Welcome back. That was a report about the Biden inauguration at the Capitol Hill in the United States. We now have joining us uh, Professor Pat Utomi, a political economist, to discuss Biden's inauguration and his speech yesterday. Good morning, sir. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Now, yesterday, the inauguration happened. I mean, everybody watched worldwide. And it's, it was just different to see how that inauguration played out because the amount of security reinforcements and all of that that occurred, you know, because of the Capitol Hill, you know, invasion, how did that strike you seeing how much of a departure it was from previous, you know, inaugurations and this one simply because of that threat to the Capitol? Well, it says a number of very simple things to me. First of all, if there's a particular kind of threat, you have to respond appropriately. So it was an appropriate uh, setting, given the times. Uh, the second lesson for me is that it says to us that democracy is always a work in progress. You should never take anything for granted in a democracy. That citizenship is central to democracy. A citizens must continually ask themselves, is this democracy working for us? And when there are threats to it, respond in the way the American people have typically responded. Uh, yes, America is divided. America has been divided for a, a while. Uh, the politics, the nature of politics, uh, became significantly dysfunctional in the last couple of years. And, and there was going to be a hard transition. It came, and America's institutions manage it very well. Amongst the institutions where its security forces that try to ensure that no untoward incident occurred in Washington, uh, D.C. yesterday. So uh, there was nothing I, you know, was phased about that happened yesterday. I think it was all appropriate, but it begins America's healing process, bringing these various tribes together because America needs uh, to do that. Like most societies, you know, uh, even though they're the ultimate melting pot, nation building is work in progress. This right. is why citizenship is important. Continual engagement of citizens to make sure that the Leviathan, the state, works for the people. And, and, and so uh, let's watch for the happy days to come again. Okay, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, America's healing process. Uh, so I'm going to go back, of course, uh, to the inauguration still. Um, not very often that you see well, presidents or people who lose elections not show up at the inauguration. And so let's talk about Donald Trump refusing to be a part of the inauguration. Does that further um, divide and create you know, even more reasons and more uh, chaos you know, in in, uh, in, in the United States, um, as it stands? I think what it does is mark him out and his place in history. Uh, I think he was never a traditionalist. He never did anything to tradition. Uh, when he was a candidate in 2016, uh, Donald Trump managed to irritate almost every Republican who was contending with him to the point of nausea. And, and so it was not traditional. There was no uh, decorum to his approach. And uh, when he was running, I still remember the, the joke by Trevor Noah, the South African-born uh, comedian, who essentially compared him with Idi Amin and Nigerian, uh, sorry, and African um, uh, uh, politicians. And he played that role all through. Uh, typically, American presidents, once they win elections, try make an effort to bring the country together. He never really tried. From get go, he just kept trying to ensure that his base was kept, you know, nourished. And it was a very, you know, uh, divisive approach. Uh, it led to many academics wondering about where America's democracy was. Several books were written about the tyranny and its uh, uh, emergence. Uh, two of the titles I like to refer to most of the time, 
uh, where is this how democracies die? Is this how democracy ends? This came from Ron Seaman at Cambridge and from Stephen um, uh, Levitsky and uh, uh, Ziblatt at Harvard. And so Americans woke up to the fact that their yeah, democracy could be at risk. And that led to the coalition that returned uh, uh, President Biden uh, uh, to uh, brought President Biden to office because people suddenly became sensitive aware that their democracy could be uh, at risk. Uh, every, every politician has their style. And that is his style. And I thought he was going to take that level of brusqueness through to the end. Okay. Uh, so not being a traditionalist, he didn't go the traditional way. Mm. But that's all history now. The important thing is that there's a new president in the United States of America, and their institutions are strong enough to ensure that transition. Now imagine an African incumbent being in that position, how things would have been now. Mm. So lessons for us about institutions. Indeed. Uh, Professor Otomi, Biden said, quote, my soul is in this, uniting our nation, uniting our people. But seeing these racial political divides in the U.S., how much of a task do you think Biden has ahead of him? It's not going to be easy, but it's doable. Um, you know, America's exceptionalism uh, is, is a fascinating thing. There is something about America. I mean, watching the whole, I, I had the privilege uh, as a graduate student nearly 40 years ago of being an intern in the US Congress. And I, I could see all those walls, corridors. I used to walk them when I watched there. Um, I could see the history that it, they carry and the pain that it brought to, to America to watch what happened on the uh, 6th of January. But it's also the strength of America. You know, interestingly, during the period that I, I, I was an intern there, the United States swore in the first woman justice of the Supreme Court in his history, Sandra Day O'Connor, and I was privileged to, to go to that. And just looking at what was happening yesterday, I saw the America that is always ready to begin again, to uh, rally its diversity into strength, even if it has had years of that diversity defining it, like racism. I mean, when I got to the US to go to grad school in the 70s, the city, a couple of miles from where I went to school, it was, uh, if you're a black person, you were advised if your car lost his tire around there, just keep driving. But all, all of that has changed in, in, the, in the last 40 years. So America has a capacity to, 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 to leave that dream of its founding fathers, even in, in its imperfections. Uh, uh, and so I, I am confident that a determined, a committed uh, a president, especially one who served in the United States Congress, for many years, who knows about the deal making that goes on in, in those chambers? Uh, it, it would be a remarkable thing. A again, let me go back to my my period there. I was also there when Anwar Sadat was killed in Egypt, and I remember the morning Reagan was president. Anwar Sadat was shot in Cairo. How everybody closed in Republicans, Democrats, the kind of speeches that were made about Anwar Sadat on the floor of the U.S. Senate that morning and how Reagan was able to pull together all living American presidents and put them on one plane to fly to Cairo. That is the spirit of America that I know, and I think it is possible for America to continue to uh, do that. All right. I, I want you to continue your thoughts with regards to uh, the racial divides. It's one of the things that he spoke about yesterday. Um, what would you expect that Joe Biden would be able to do or should do to heal that you know, aspect of the American society today. Donald Trump's four years, basically, of, you know, people would say, exposed a lot of uh, those uh, divisions and that level of uh, systemic racism that has been there even before Donald Trump. He, he didn't bring it in, maybe all, you know, um, his time only maybe just exposed it further. But even during 
um, uh, President, uh, former President Barack Obama, you know, there was, you know, some of all those things that were pretty evident. Um, Joe Biden, you know, is um, said to be the one who wrote the 94 crime bill that has been described as very, very um, unfair to blacks. So what would you expect that he would be able to do in the time that he is president to fix the racial um, uh, divides that exist in the United States of America? Well, first of all, um, I think that he has started with the nominations uh, that he has uh, made. This is probably, if Senate approves everything, going to be the most inclusive cabinet in American history of all the divides in America. So that is a, a starting point of bringing people together. Um, when, I, when I talk about the unfortunate situation in our own country, I often go back to um, a, a book written in 1948 by an American called Thomas Kingsley, it's titled Representative Bureaucracy. And nothing makes people feel greater part of something than when they can identify with those who are making decisions on their behalf. And what uh, President Biden has managed to do in many of his speaks for cabinet positions and other such positions is that he's brought in America's brightest, brought from across the divides. Uh, and, and that's what we argue for in our country. We don't have to become nepotistic. You know, uh, we can get the best people from every part of our country. Uh, uh, and that representation, that inclusion, uh, facilitates a sense of being for most citizens. And, and that is a first important step for uh, President Biden to travel. Uh, the crime bill, and, you know, perceptions and times are important. You know, there was a season when crime was such in America that if you were not a law and order candidate, you really were not speaking to the worries of America. Even though a, a, a racial group might seem, on the face of it, to be was hit by a particular kind of bill, even Kamala Harris has yes. been uh, harassed for her strong law and order role as uh, a, 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 a prosecutor, a attorney general in California, uh, you know. So you will always get that because of the nature of these problems. But when you look at the heart of the man and you, and you look at the things he has generally stood for, you will know that he is very likely, I mean, don't forget in America's history, uh, that it was a Southern president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the person, the kind of person you expected to be uh, uh, um, the most uh, negative, if you want to use that term, on race, that brought us the civil rights uh, 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 push that led to where we are today. Well, starting from, if you go back to Kennedy, I mean, Kennedy, yes, was the first to do the symbolic things, but it was really the uh, Great Society programs of Lyndon Baines Johnson that, that advanced the emancipation. So I, I think that uh, um, in many ways, uh, uh, Biden is a, a product of that tradition. Uh, there's, there's a little video that I think has gone viral of him talking to a Nigerian family in Springfield, Illinois. And if you hear the remarks that he made in that video, uh, you will see uh, the makings of the commitment. And that's the most important thing, a commitment to uniting people, bringing them together. You're not gonna get 100%, you're gonna get the iconoclasts who will fire away. Uh, you know, I, I remember during the Clinton presidency, uh, uh, one of those, um, right-wing radio broadcasters, uh, um, you know, who every day Clinton was in office was considered America held hostage. He counted every day. This is day 368 in America held hostage. Uh, Rush Limbaugh, 
went on and on, and, and those who will follow him will follow him. It does not prevent America from still being a place of freedom. That's what's important, that it will accommodate the fringe elements, but protect everybody oh. within the law. The rule of law is what matters. Oh, and that's what I think he's going to try and, and, and do. Mm. Uh, ensure that the institutions uh, make people leave the rule of law. Okay. Here's a quote uh, by Joe Biden uh, at the inauguration yesterday. He said, democracy is fragile, and at this hour, democracy has prevailed. On this hallowed ground, where just a few days ago, violence sought to shake the capital to its very foundations, we come together as one nation on the God, indivisible, to carry out the peaceful transfer of power as we have for more than two centuries. Now, Biden repeatedly talked about how democracy has prevailed. And this leads us to finally, if it, you know, a last conversation on you know, the US elections and Trump's allegations of electoral fraud. How do you react to Trump's claims? Um, I think that if Trump had any evidence, he would have produced it a long time ago. I think that he was just uh, uh, an egocentric a megalomaniac who could not bring himself to accept that he had been rejected by the American people. I think that he built so much around his base that he did not think his base could be beaten. Unfortunately, the reality of what happened was that his style forced a coalition of all of those who were disgusted by his style and led to the election of uh, uh, President Biden. Hmm. And uh, how about his comments about uh, generally when Biden spoke, we could see how much people felt his words. Some people cried, some people, you could see the hope in their eyes for America. What are your comments on Joe Biden as a charismatic leader? Well, his speech was appropriate, was not extraordinary, was appropriate. It responded to the moment. Uh, it was not like the Camelot uh, invoking speech of John F. Kennedy. Uh, and there have been great inaugural addresses. Uh, you may even go back uh, uh, to that of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so in, in the matter of speaking, it was not an extraordinary speech, but it was a very appropriate speech. What the moment was about is the healing of America and the fact that America's democracy could be threatened and overcome that threat. And uh, American people needed to get the sense that the threat to their democracy was not um, essentially uh, fundamental damage. Indeed, I think, quite, quite frankly, that the um, Trump presidency was important for America because it helped America realize that there was some other side. The rush of liberalism, the rush of um, this uh, new re relativist order, this relativism, everything is relative. Uh, and quite frankly, Barack Obama represented that significantly, uh, had its challenges because it tended to sweep away a very important part of American society, a conservative America that did not understand these newfangled ideas that stretched the concept of freedom. And it was important to have a Trump to remind liberals in America that there was another side of America. Right. So in that sense, the Trump presidency was a very important presidency. The Trump persona was a challenging persona. And it got in the way of the conservative message. Because in some ways, Trump was an opportunist who was not a traditional conservative. But the traditional conservatives were too desperate for a spokesperson that when this opportunist walked onto the stage, a populist, and mobilized their passions, they couldn't but just go along with him. Even though fundamentally, Trump did not represent the values of conservative America. And that's the you know, the, 
paradox of the Trump presidency. Right, because I, he didn't I'm represent not. those he wanted to represent. All right. And he put America in an awkward shape. Uh, Professor Tommy, I, I don't know if you would you know, also say, and I, I, I think you would speak on this before we go, um, I don't know if you would also say that the current administration in Nigeria was also important, the same way you've described Trump's presidency as important. Uh, I don't know if you would say that it was important because there were lessons that we were well, meant, oh, yes, we were in meant some to ways, learn. Um, <laughs> the current administration in Nigeria is important in telling us the limits of being narrow-minded. Um, you know, the, the, the politics of Nigeria, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, some friend of mine who writing generally about foreign policy often refers to this, uh, Professor George Ubiozo, uh, uh, the policies of precarious balancing. If you look at how smart people like Tafawa Balewa had to be to, to lead Nigeria and to balance its various tendencies, uh, uh, which uh, is referred to as precarious balancing. Uh, um, but we then move from that to complete, because of state capture, disregard, impunity. And somehow it was covered up by decency, oh, let's not push the, this thing, until we were hit in the face by people who cared very little for others. And so in that regard, yes, I think this current experience reminds us of the fact that we need to rebuild a country that cares about everybody. Okay. I, I, I also want you to um, talk about other world powers. Um, people would argue that in the last four years, uh, China and Russia, you know, must have seen a, a part of America that a lot of people had never expected. Yes, the institutions eventually stood strong and were able to save the democracy that America has today, and they've had for more than 200 years. But you know, there might still be fears that uh, Russia and China, you know, in particular, may have seen a very, you know, very, very vulnerable side of the United States of America. Um, do you think that Joe Biden has work to do to show that the U.S. is still um, the world power that it has always been? And how hard, you know, would that be for him? Well, I think the first and important thing is that a, a President Biden will return to multilateralism. The fact that Trump got out of global concert against the Paris Accord, he withdrew against um, World Health Organization and, and all of those things. Uh, in fact, a little and Trump, Trump would have been back to the era of isolationism. You know, uh, uh, um, a more um, multilateral-minded leader would be able to build global coalitions against those who are not playing to the global order. Uh, China has its value in the way the world is going, but China also has a dangerous mindset that we need a certain containment of. Um, you know, back in the days of the Cold War, uh, we talked about all kinds of strategies, including mad, mutually assured destruction, where the fact that the powers could technically all liquidate everybody and all of that led to caution in behavior. Um, I think that we reached a sad, no, sorry, an unfortunate presumption uh, which Fukuyama's book, you know, uh, 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 the end of history, it tended to uh, lead us to believe that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we now had a Pax Americana, one world. No, the rise of China, the rise of India, the troubles of uh, global terror from some religious movements uh, brought out that we had not reached the end of history. Uh, in the middle of all of this, China's greater confidence has, however, led it to be, in some ways, too narrow in itself. I mean, Africa, I was in the team that did some of the earliest studies on Africa's, uh, China's growing influence in Africa. And I was one of those that said, it's important, let all flowers bloom, let Africa 
play with China. But Africa must be very careful not to replace uh, uh, the West with something more dangerous. It was always important that Africa make its own choices. And right now, Unfortunately, we have uh, yeah. network issues. We'll try to reconnect with uh, yeah. Professor Otomi on the breakfast. But there's still so much issues to go through. There's issue of coronavirus and how Biden plans to tackle this, how he's reversing all of Trump's policies, how he's tackling domestic terrorism. Yes. And we do hope, yes, we, we now know that we have uh, Professor Otomi back in line. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Right, welcome yes. Back. No, sorry. I, I was saying that it's important using a multilateral approach to help get new powers like China to behave in the interest of the whole, the common good of a planet imperial. Uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, Biden has the skills to advance that. All right. But it's a very, let, let, let's, uh... it's a thing that must be based on skills. Yeah, okay. Oh, well. We have um, limited time, so let, let's quickly bring in other yes, uh, details here. Yes, there's the issue of coronavirus. I mean, it's a worldwide pandemic right now. And uh, we know how the how Trump, you know, his stance on the pandemic, on the virus, and how he handled it in the U.S., including how many people, you know, criticize how he basically handled the virus in the U.S. But Joe Biden has a different plan. In fact, he has a website dedicated to this. He called it the Joe Biden COVID-19 plan. So how do you think that COVID-19 uh, would affect the U.S. going forward and how Joe Biden plans to handle this regarding what he said, you know, giving, you know, health care support to frontline workers and all of that? Well, um, first of all, you've got to begin from the point of view that uh, Donald Trump was considered uh, a science doubter. Uh, incidentally, I was, I was giving a talk in... Um, Sacramento in California about three or four, three, three years or so ago. And, and uh, somebody invited me to a dinner by scientists who wanted to go on demonstration against uh, the new president, Trump, because his statements kind of like were dis dismissing science. So from get-go, Donald Trump, and I think based originally on his comments on the environment uh, and cl uh, global warming and all of that, from get-go, Donald Trump was a science doubter. I was one of those people, hey, forget about uh, what science says about the way the environment is going, diseases, we'll overcome everything, we're America, let's just produce, make money. Uh, so that mindset affected how he approached uh, the coronavirus issue, and it hurt America. It hurt America because it didn't allow America to put in place a strategy that would have reduced significantly the number of deaths that we've seen in that country. It's a country too rich and too powerful and whose advance was based significantly on its investments in healthcare for what happened to America to have happened with this virus. So uh, I see um, more resources being poured into this. I see a greater discipline. I mean, I see how people like uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci struggle with, with trying to report to a president who didn't believe in their work uh, under Trump. And I think that the science community will get a chance to do what they know how to do well, respond to leadership. I mean, it's like the space exploration and how Kennedy tried to motivate the science community when the Soviet Union got ahead of America in launching Yuri Gagarin into orbit. And you saw how the science community responded in America. All right. In a similar way, if you had a kind of Kennedy president when coronavirus hit, and that president had tried to inspire the science community uh, the way Kennedy did on the space race, we would have seen a kind of different outcome in America. But America right. was unfortunate to have a science doubter in Donald Trump as president at the time this virus broke. All right, so he sent so many misleading signals. Yeah, I, I, I quickly also speak on uh, domestic terrorism. Um, you know, there's, of course, uh, the narrative that Donald Trump didn't do enough, you know, to stop uh, some of that growing and expanding in, in the U.S. Um, how can Joe Biden do different or do better with regards to the growth of domestic terrorism in the United States? Well, you know, whenever there is a case of terrorism, 
it calls for uh, the deployment of a number of things, soft power. Uh, yes, a law and order approach to it uh, can contain things, but it leads to things being bottled up, people who are angry about certain things. So what is most effective is for political leaders to exercise that leadership in building, if you will, lines of communication to people who take extreme views uh, to bring more people to the middle. Uh, you go, just like in our country, you're not going to solve Boko Haram by sending some soldiers there every day. Yes, you need that to contain things. In the meanwhile, you've got to find ways of making people realize that that is a path to folly. And then as they become more convinced, then you will reduce uh, the effect of their anger against the system. Uh, many of these guys are nihilists who really don't know what it is they are fighting. So you've got to educate them. Uh, like in Nigeria, the biggest problem we have is education. Uh, most of your, the troubles we have come from people who are not educated enough, knowledgeable enough to realize that they're acting even against their own best self-interest. Uh, maybe because they've been cut out by the system long enough that they have nothing to lose. So um, I, I hope that uh, a Biden presidency will look for ways of building those bridges and going on the liberal limb is not the way to do it. And, and that's the brilliance of, um, of people like um, Bill Clinton because they moved to a third way. They moved to the middle. Uh, Biden must resist the pressure to move further left. All right. And in moving more to the middle, uh, accommodate the right a little more that is getting angrier and angrier at this uh, cultural relativism okay. of the liberal order. Yes, I think, I think that's, that's the much we can take right now on The Breakfast. Professor Pat Utomi, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate you coming to share your thoughts with us about the Biden inauguration and, you know, hopes for his presidency in the U.S. You're welcome. All right. Looking forward to speaking with you again. And, of course, uh, have an amazing week ahead. Professor Pat Utomi, a political economist, uh, a pretty popular figure here in, uh, in, in the Nigerian political space. Um, yes, I mean, I can't help but, you know, just read and read, reread this quote by Joe Biden. He said, I would be a president for all Americans, and I promise you I will fight as hard for those who did not support me as for those who did. So if you're part of those yeah. who invaded the Capitol, Joe Biden has a you know, but I mean, it, it makes it makes you wonder, you know, if you believe in political speeches or not. Um, it would also makes you wonder if you believe in political speeches in the U.S. better than you would believe in politi political speeches here in Nigeria. Because, yeah. oh, come on, we we we've dealt with you know some of you know these very interesting speeches in the past, and look at how we turned out. Well, um, from state governors to presidents, so all you know the whole the whole you know nine yards. But anyway, yes, yeah, so um, let's let's give let's give him that grace. Let's see just how this turns out. Good luck to the U.S. All right, um, we're moving now to talking about something here in Nigeria. Teachers, uh, of course, a bill has been passed to increase the age of retirement for teachers in Nigeria from 60 to 65. And the active years of service would also increase from uh, 35 to 40 years. How much of a great move is this in our country today? And how will this also affect our education system here in Nigeria? We will be speaking with two persons when we come back after the short break. Stay with us here on The Breakfast. <music>